We good? All right. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, we'll call this uh, informational hearing to order. Um, it's too bad we're not in person again this year, but um, we just want to give a, a rundown of um, the budget and some of the other things um, we have to go through tonight. Um, I'm Alicia Malay, chair of the select board. Um, my colleagues on the select board are Vice Chair David Mills, Hank Pelkey, Tom Hooker, and Joe Gagne. Um, so um, we're going to be holding this informational hearing so we can present our proposed general fund, highway fund, and village fund budgets to you with an opportunity after each presentation for uh, questions and comments. Um, and if you haven't already uh, voted um, by mail, um, tomorrow between seven and seven at the fire station. You can come and vote in person. We'll um, have time for audience questions or comments. And if we will ask just please that you can either, if you're calling, if you're on the phone, you can hit star nine and that will alert us that you have a question. Otherwise, if you're, if you're on Zoom, you can just either actually wave your hand or use the little hand wave tab button, whatever that is. <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna start with uh, town reviews. We're gonna begin with covering captions with town manager, John Haverstock. Uh, thank you, Alicia. You hopefully by now have received your town report. That's probably how you learned about this event. Um, I'm here just to talk about the cover. And that of course, is right there. It shows the new fire ladder truck heading up Arch Street after having been delivered to the town. On the front cover is the new 2020 HME Aaron's Fox 80 foot aerial quint fire truck as it rolls by McClure Library um, during the winter of 2021. The photograph, which is excellent by the way, was taken by our own uh, local resident, Aaron Ujera. Thanks very much. Take it away, Alicia. All right, thank you. All right, well, I have the honor of being able to read um, the dedication to Barb Willis. Over the years, Pittsburgh resident Barb Willis has generously given her time and support to numerous worthy causes in town. For example, she has been tireless in her work for the McClure Library. She has supported the mission of the library through fundraising, coin drops, book sales, raffles, bake sales, etc. By attendance and by talking up the library's many offerings at Pits for Day, Pumpkin Party, Trunk or Tree, and the list goes on. Barb came to the library daily for the worst months of the COVID pandemic, helping the staff while they took time for lunch. Barb is a regular at the library's many and varied programs, including the book club, knitting club, cookbook club, and meditation circle, and many other lectures and events, volunteering her time for both setup and cleanup. Barb's work is not confined to the library's interior. However, she is helped to plant hostas and cedar trees outside on the library grounds. As a proud and passionate member of the Pittsburgh Historical Society, Barb has served on the PHS Board of Directors and as its Vice President. She has spent a great deal of time updating the PHS files on local businesses and has worked hard to collect information for the Pittsburgh Veterans Project. A former employee of Crockett Cards, Barb has taken a special interest in helping the PHS sell the museum's Crockett Card collections to the public. In addition, Barb has assisted with the museum's annual tag and bake sale and shows up with a smile to work every Tuesday the Eaton Hall Museum is open. Barb also serves the people of our community as the president of the Pittsburgh Cemetery Association. She has also worked to raise funds for the Bowen Walker Fund, which helps needy people with their utility bills, and for Pittsburgh Santa Fund, which provides gifts to needy children. Furthermore, whenever town staff need a helping hand on a big project, Barb is always there to pitch in. Born in Proctor, Barb has lived nearly all her life here in Pittsburgh. She and her late husband, Jim, raised two daughters, Liz and Sarah. With her free time, Barb enjoys knitting, reading, and dining out with girlfriends. Barb is an absolute, absolute asset to this town, and this is very, very worthy of this dedication. And the next dedication is to the recreation team, which will be read by David Mills. The town's recreation department has long been a source of programming, a means of learning, an opportunity for exercise in the great outdoors, and a way for residents and visitors to get together. The town enthusiastically welcomes its new rec director, Jennifer Pop. Jen has been very busy building programs, renewing relationships with other groups and agencies, and communicating with the Pittsburgh community in a wide variety of formats 
some traditional and some new. Assisting Jen every step of the way are the dedicated and hardworking volunteers serving on the town's recreation committee. Rob Ketchum, the chairman, Kathy Shortsleeve, the vice chair, Monica Keith, Jill Blanchard, <coughs> Kelly Cotton, Conahan, uh, Hillary Mullen, and Robert Light. Former longtime recreation director, Randy Adams, has been very helpful to Jen as well, donating a substantial amount of time to help Jen get her footing as the new director. <coughs> the town has a wonderful trail system and a devoted roster of veteran volunteers who work to maintain the trail network in good walkable condition. Under the leadership of Baird Morgan and Bob Harnish, the Trails Committee helps townspeople and visitors from far and wide appreciate the many natural blessings and vistas that the town has to offer. Trails Committee membership includes Trailmaster Baird Morgan and Bob Harnish, Amy Hitchcock, Betsy Morgan, John Mayhew, Carolyn Mayhew, Michael Thomas, Sarah Willis, Barb Willis, Ursula Hirschman, Steve Belcher, Rob Ketchum, Peter Cady, Reggie Charmino, and Jim Hill. Keeping the lovely acreage of the Pittsford Rec area in top tip-top shape is longtime groundskeeper Joe Pamacala. Every time you marvel at the splendid condition of the wreck, please remember the great contributions made over the years by Joe. Together, the Recreation Director, Groundskeeper, Rec Committee, and Trails Committee do a tremendous job providing programming and lovely areas in which to enjoy the great outdoors here in Pittsburgh. Thank you all. Okay, next we'll move on to Article 1 to hear the report of the town officers. And we'll begin um, by recognizing uh, Representatives Butch Shaw and Stephanie Jerome, as well as Senator Cheryl Hooker. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's meeting, and thank you for allowing us to take up some of your precious time on Zoom tonight, give you a really brief update of what we think is going on in, in Montpelier. Uh, just as a matter of record, uh, a brief bio of my service uh, to the town and, and the position as your state representative. I was appointed in 2009 by then Governor uh, Jim Douglas, uh, seated in 2010. And I've been in, in the legislature since then, 13 years. Uh, I was uh, originally assigned to the Committee on Corrections and Institutions, where I served 11 years, the last six as vice chair. And then uh, two years ago, I was moved to the uh, Transportation Committee, where I currently serve as vice chair. I thought I'd give you just a real quick overview of the state's investments in the town of Pittsburgh. And in and our little bit in our region uh, over this next coming year. Um, so at the, uh, at the police academy, which is a really valuable asset, I think for our town and, and the local economy, we just the state just committed finished the renovations of the East Cottage for 25 additional uh, bedrooms and conference space for people using the facility at a cost of about 1.7 million dollars. They've also the state's also funded a provider funding for a master plan for the academy as what it's going to look like in the next five to 10 years. And so, which gives me confidence that that academy will, will remain in Pittsburgh. Uh, as you see, segment one of the, uh, of the Route 7 project is substantially complete uh, with an investment there of about $9 million in state and federal funds. Mills Bridge is awaiting Act 250 uh, a permit appeal uh, resolution, uh, when that gets resolved, that project's going to be in the neighborhood of about 7.5 million. Was scheduled to bid last October and then scheduled to bid again in February of this year. Uh, and now that's hopefully we'll be able to bid that in, uh, in May if, if the permit appeal gets resolved. The project I talked about last year that was funded or was, was fixing up Route 7 from Mills, Mills Bridge to Otter Valley to as a temporary fix to get us something we can drive on uh, in that location until those segments of that highway is completed. Unfortunately, the job turned out to be bigger than what they had originally thought. So they ended up having to do uh, quite a bit of engineering on the project uh, to uh, make leveling possible. Uh, that, that is actually now finally uh, out to bid. It'll bid on March 18th with an estimate of 
construction estimate of about $1.9 million. And we're, I'm hoping for June construction on that. Segment four, uh, which is the uh, segment between what I call the hockey barn, the red barn with Detroit's uh, red wing symbol on it, to Otter Valley is scheduled to bid late 2023, pending court cases that people have brought against the state uh, uh, concerning right away and remuneration for purchase of right away. Uh, that that's ongoing. It's in the courts. So we hope to see a, a resolution to that fairly quickly. And finally. Uh, Segment three, which is from the village line, uh, the North, Northern village line to that same hockey barn is uh, moving slowly towards uh, a bid of late, probably 26 or 27. And that's estimated to cost about 15, $16 million. And I bring these up to you so that to all of you, so that you understand that our section of Rutland County, the Pittsburgh uh, Brandon section of Rutland County is well represented in, in the state and, and are able to bring these particular projects forward, uh, knowing that we just completed segment six in, six in the middle of Brandon for a total project cost up there of about $28 million. Hearing that, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the general fund budget. Uh, the the common thread throughout the state is that we're loaded, we're swimming in money with all this federal money coming in. And all uh, we had the, the ARPA money, the Corona relief money, now the uh, uh, inf infrastructure money for transportation is, is now coming in. Nothing could be further from the truth. The state is not swimming in money. Matter of fact, my conversations with a member of the appropriations committee last Friday before I left, the vice chair of that committee said to me, I wish people knew that the state of Vermont is broke. We, we are making our projected revenue uh, forecast. We for, forecast how much money we're gonna take in and uh, try to hit those marks so that we can plan a budget. However, when COVID hit, they downgraded those revenue estimates by 20% that we thought we were going to, going to have coming in. Currently, we are hitting the lower marks, uh, actually doing quite well against the lower marks. I heard all the other day that we are potentially out of Medicaid money, and maybe Senator Hooker can talk about that a little bit, with the pressure and, and caseload in, in Medicaid. Uh, the pressures throughout the budget are, are massive. Uh, the, uh, uh, and and we're, their appropriations is working through that now to see where, where we can come out ahead the greatest uh, confidence in House appropriations and along with Senate appropriations that will come, come out with a balanced budget, but it's gonna be painful to get there. Uh, state funding is on track, but it's our, our income from state funding is quite a bit lower. And we see that in the transportation fund, a fund that has been historically well-funded and running in a surplus. Now that's running in a deficit. Uh, we, you all read about a $90 million surplus in the Ed Fund. That's been largely uh, appropriated in, in the current iteration of, of the budget in the House. Don't know, I don't know the outcome yet because in Montpelier, we, always, we don't talk about things until the governor signs the bill. Saying that, uh, we do have a large amount of money in, coming in on the uh, uh, Federal Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act. That's the big act that we all heard from in Washington that was by a bipartisan uh, billion, multi-billion dollar bill to improve our transportation and highway structures, highway and bridge structures throughout the country. We have uh, over five years, well, Vermont will be receiving about $1.7 billion in transportation but uh, funds with about another $5 billion in funds for broadband build out and other infrastructure uh, needs. There's a caveat, to re there is a caveat to receiving this funding and we need to be uh, cognizant of that. I'm really excited to, to see this influx of federal funds coming in, but my enthusiasm is very tempered by the fact until first of all, the federal Congress passes an FY23 general fund budget. IIJA is currently largely unfunded because the money that to fund it is in that budget. So until we're, we're on a work, the feds are working on a continuing resolution now, it's scheduled to be voted on again 
a budget schedule to be voted on again about March 11th. Hopefully they'll pass a budget that will include the, the billions of dollars included in this, in this fund. And we will see, uh, once this fund becomes fully realized, we'll see more money coming to towns. We're already seeing off what they call off network bridges, uh, covered bridges being funded for repair and some of the old trust bridges funded repair. And I'm hoping the bridge on uh, Kendall Hill Road will meet those specifications so we can get some money for that. What this all does at the end of the day to the current transportation budget creates a $30 million annual hole in the transportation fund because we have to match the IIJA money with a 20% state match. That, and that's for five years, it will be a 20 to $29 million hole in the, in the T-Fund budget. And the, the, our trick now is to fill that hole without raising taxes. And uh, we're working pretty hard to do that. And finally, uh, we've all heard that this is a redistricting year. And I will preface talking about redistricting by saying the House has not voted on the map that we currently have for redistricting, so anything can change. However, and I think uh, Representative Jerome will agree with me that the current map for Rutland County is pretty complete, and I think maybe Senator uh, Hooker will speak to the, the Senate side. But when redistricting happened uh, this year, uh, the original maps uh, showed the town of Pittsford and Proctor uh, being a single member district and the Pittsburgh BCA approved that thought from the legislative reapportionment board. That, that board sent their, their results to the legislature where the legislature then takes, makes up their own map. And we ran around to Pittsburgh and went around the building several times with several different iterations of, of possible districts. And of, as of last week, when they settled on Rutland County, it appears, uh, should the bill pass, that Pittsburgh and Proctor will be in a single, single member district. And we'll let Representative Jerome talk about her new district. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I think I will just uh, sit down, uh, already down, but virtually sit down and pass the baton. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Representative Jerome. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, it has, thank you, Butch, also. And um, I just want to say that it's been my pleasure to continue to uh, represent Pittsburgh in the General Assembly. In the General Assembly. Uh, it is hard to believe that it's halfway through um, the session. The first two weeks of our session were done virtually, so we were all working from home. And then uh, the House decided to, uh, to change it up and do a hybrid mode. And for the most part, most of us were in uh, in person in in the state house um, for the past six weeks. Um, so it has been an interesting time to be there, and it's been interesting working. But we've been able to do quite quite a bit of really good, solid work so far. And just I want to just go run through uh, our legislative priorities, and those, of course, are those investment of those federal stimulus funds that Butch addressed and to make sure that we can have a strong recovery in Vermont um, post COVID-19 and then create a strong footing for our future and to make sure that all those funds are spent wisely. And I think from Butch's um, review, you can see that the state is really working hard and the legislature is working hard to be really responsible with those funds. We're also continuing to uh, tackle the issues of housing and childcare workforce development, climate change, pensions, mental health, substance use disorder, healthcare access, broadband and cell phone coverage. So lots of really big issues that continue to be worked on. So I serve on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee and I am the ranking member of that committee. And I just wanted to, my focus in talking tonight is going to be on workforce development. And that's the, the major priority of the governor as well as the legislature. And uh, my committee is doing the, um, is putting together a bill H703 that will focus on workforce development and workforce retention. And I just wanted to run down a little bit of what that bill is going to uh, encompass so far. 
So according to data, data that we received from the state economist, uh, there are 25,000 less people working right now than before the pandemic. But of course, prior to COVID-19 um, in March, 2020, we knew these were gonna be problems, but these issues were exposed even more because of, of the pandemic. And there are many reasons now, um, not just one reason, but it was retire early retirement and retirements, ongoing childcare issues, concerns about health and safety related to COVID. Um, the higher hourly wage has resulted that people have not had the need to have additional part-time jobs. Um, then, and then there's also a really high number of new business startups. And of course, housing is a thread that we know is a um, issue, a, a, not only locally, but um, regionally and statewide. So in H703, we're looking at critical workforce shortages. And one of the major ones that we're focusing on is the healthcare workforce crisis and trying to increase the training and education pipeline for nursing, for nurses. So we are supporting colleges and universities in the state, uh, the state programs, and there's four of them, UVM, Vermont State Colleges has several, CCV has some, and then Vermont, um, and then Norwich University. We want to increase the size of the nursing schools and the number of students they can educate. We're going to expand our loans and, and scholarships, but pivotal to all this is making sure that there's enough nursing educators. So there has been a, a nurse educators uh, have a low salary compared to uh, hospital nurses, and there are too many vacancies throughout the state. So we're trying to increase those, to help do what we can to do short-term increases in their salaries. Uh, we want to, ex the second thing we want to do is expand our labor force. We're uh, providing funds for internships and apprenticeships, big focus on apprenticeships, uh, efforts to remove workforce barriers for retirees, uh, those with disabilities, and for folks who have, um, have a history of justice involvement. Um, we are looking to connect graduates of Vermont public and private colleges and universities with entry level jobs in the state and encouraging businesses to take a risk on young workers, young graduates and fill the current job openings. And we're encouraging in migration into the state as well as uh, resettlement of refugees. And uh, we know that there's a, going to be a group of, I think about a hundred um, Afghan refugees we, Afghan families resettled into uh, the Rutland area. The third thing we're doing is funding uh, on career pathways and looking into loans and scholarships for Vermont State College, CCV, UVM, trade schools, and apprenticeships, particularly looking at green economy and climate workforce, and also looking at critical occupations such as healthcare, technology, advanced technology, manufacturing, business administration and skilled <laughs> trades. The fourth thing we're looking at is strengthening our adult and technical education. It's our understanding that over 3000 students graduate high school every year without a clear path for a work plan, for entering the military, higher education or training. And so we need to train and, re and reskill these workers uh, for higher paid wages and jobs and professions. Last legislative, last legislative session, um, the legislature funded two free courses at um, institutions throughout the, without Vermont, and they were taken up in a record time. I think UVM's certification classes were gone in three days. So uh, I think we, and we think we funded them for a million dollars. And that, and it's, was, that was repeated from CCV to VTC and Vermont State Colleges. So we know there's a need and that people really desire to get more training and more certifications. And we're helping them because it's, um, these were free. Sure. So we're hoping that we'll continue to do something like that. And then um, we are also looking at our career and technical education centers and figuring out how to, the issues with funding and the, the current funding follows the students. So there's less of an incentive for local high schools to send their kids to Stafford or to Hannaford. And so we're trying to figure out a better, more equitable way to, to get that funding, both for students and for adults. 
um, and looking at online learning for career and technical education, as well as investments to upgrade the facilities in the career and technical education centers. And our fifth uh, point is to fund an organization to help with job coaching and career guidance and counseling. And there's going to be six at this moment, looks like six regional um, so job centers, slightly different than the Vermont Department of Labor centers and more inclusive, more expansive. Um, and there'll be one in the Rutland region as well, sort of fine tuning on how, what, how to best fit those needs so we get more workers into the jobs that are open. And uh, lastly, we're looking at ways to help the creative economy um, move forward. They were the last, they were the first to close and the last to open. We want to get in these, these creative sectors footing on the right, um, back on the strong footing and um, helping this creative sector open up fully again and, um, and get into um, back where they were. So when we go back in March, we'll be looking at the Senate's omnibus economic development bill and um, work on making sure that we all come, can come up with a great right sort of plan between the House and the Senate on um, moving forward with our workforce development. So I have posted in the chat or will post in the chat um, my town meeting report, which talks about this and also about eight or 10 other issues that are going on in the legislature. So feel free to read that. Um, and i um, happy to uh, answer any questions anytime. And um, oh, I will circle back now. So Butch talked about redistricting. <laughs> it looks like the next, um, in uh, the redistricting for me is that I has made that Brandon is a single seat district. Its population grew enough so that it's uh, about a little over 4,100 people and it can support one, one person um, as their representative, just like it was in the old days when um, Bob Wood was uh, the representative for, for Brandon. So um, I think it's gonna be a little different, but I wanted to rest assured that I will be representing Pittsburgh until uh, next November when this all, or next January actually, when this all changes. And um, it has been my absolute pleasure to uh, work with all of you. And um, I have truly enjoyed representing you in the, in the General Assembly. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Senator Hooker. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for letting me crash your town meeting tonight for a minute. Um, <clears throat> I'll pick up where Stephanie left off about redistricting. Butch had said that, um, you know, the House has pretty much looked at their map and, and they've put it out there. The Senate isn't quite there yet. But from what I've heard, Rutland County will remain pretty much the same with the exception of perhaps bringing Mount Holly back into the fold. Um, I know that the house redistricting is a lot more involved really than the Senate. There had been talk perhaps of doing single Senate districts, but from what I'm hearing, uh, Rutland County will still have three senators at large. So that being said, uh, I serve on the health care committee uh, in the Senate, and I'm vice chair of the education committee as well. I'm also the majority whip, and our three priorities in the Senate, which Stephanie and Butch have already referred to in a number of ways, are housing, workforce development, and the environment. And we've, I know that Stephanie had kind of put workforce development first, which is wonderful, but we've sort of looked at housing. There's a group called Housing First. If we don't have the housing to put people in, they can't come here. And we've seen that over and over. We've seen it from the hospitals. We've seen it from in education uh, where people just can't find places to live. So housing is a huge issue. There's a big housing bill coming out of economic development. I did serve on economic development a couple of years ago. And really, um, we're still talking about the same issue of lack of housing. Um, Workforce development, Stephanie did a great job of telling you what the Commerce Committee is doing in the House. <clears throat> We're looking at workforce development throughout the, the 
committees that we serve on. Certainly in healthcare, workforce development is huge. The nursing shortage is absolutely cr critical and we need to look at that. We need to look at more primary care physicians. We need to look at for more dentists. Let me tell you, I tried to reschedule a, or cancel a dental appointment and reschedule it. And I was told that I couldn't reschedule. They're not rescheduling appointments because they have no dental hygienists. So that's another issue that's huge um, as far as critical workforce. And Steph did a great job of talking about um, technical career and technical ed. We're also in education looking at kind of regular ed, you know, K through 12, uh, because we have had a, a massive exodus, really, of teachers, and we really haven't had the teachers coming in to fill the voids. The pandemic has created havoc in our educational system. It's coming back now, we're getting back to normal, but it has been just brutal on faculty and staff uh, in our schools. So we're working hard to try to make Vermont the state that that people want to teach in. Um, there are a number of, a number of um, possibilities that are going into an omnibus uh, education bill and we're just trying to make it a more appealing place for people to come to teach. And so um, those are a couple of things that are happening. With regard, I wish I had the answer to the Medicaid issue. I don't, but I can tell you that our Health and Welfare Committee is starting to look at global budgeting for hospitals, which I think will be a big help. Um, we're looking at the blueprint for, for um, health care in the state and upgrading that. And, um, you know, there are, there are just so many things. Stephanie said she has 10 other things that she didn't even mention that are in her report. And I'm sure that you'll find them very interesting. If you have any questions, any comments, or any solutions, please call us. Please don't hesitate to uh, pick up the phone or email us so that we know where you, your concerns are. We know what is of interest to you. And um, we can move ahead with that. So thanks again for having me. And uh, we'll let you go on with your your meeting tonight. I'm going to skip over to another town meeting, and we'll see you soon, I hope. All right. Thank you very much. Now, does anyone have any questions for either Representative Sean Jerome or Senator Hooker before we move on? Questions, comments? Star nine if you're on the phone. Okay. Seeing none, um, then I'd just like to remind everybody that um, in the town report, uh, the reports of the town officers and boards and commissions are on pages uh, 4 through 20. Information about the town are on pages 41 through 56. Uh, information from outside entities with received town report, pages 57 to 77. Minutes from last year's town meeting are on pages 78 to 80. Listing of elected and appointed officers on pages 81 to 83, and school district reports on pages 84 to 86. Um, and does anyone have any questions or comments regarding um, any of these reports before we move on to Article 2? Okay, seeing none, Article 2, General Fund. Um, I'll just provide a brief overview, and then Town Manager John Haverstock um, will give a more detailed presentation. Um, also, thank you to Town Manager John Haverstock and Assistant Linda Drummond and all the department heads and the staff in the Town Clerk's Office for their help with the budgets and all the preparations for town meeting, including assembling the town report. Um, okay, the select board is presenting um, fiscal year 2023 budgets, um, but just a first recap from 2021, um, which ended June 30th. The general fund balance increased by $85,747 to $249,914, and the highway fund balance increased by 
$545 from a negative balance of $33,998 to $149,547. Um, so 21-22 budget year, um, nearly two thirds of the way through the current 2022 budget cycle as of 228-22. Uh, general fund expenses are at 68.6% of the budget, and highway expenses are at 82.7%. Um, the auditor's opinion is that the town of Pittsburgh finances are in good shape, um, that there are no significant shortcomings in how town finances are being administered. In fact, the town's auditor confirmed this in testimony before the select board at our February 16th meeting. Actually, he won't do so until March 2nd. Sorry okay, <laughs> wrong date, sorry. <laughs> um, so is the audit report even up then on our, uh, we're not? It will be on the website shortly, but the auditor will present to us Wednesday night at the regular select okay. board meeting. All right, there's that updated date. <laughs> um, okay, and so now a more uh, detailed look at the proposed 22-23 general fund budget will be presented by town manager, John Haverstock. Uh, thanks, Alicia. Um, as you know, Alicia gave you a brief overview and um, talked about bottom lines for the general fund budget. I'll take just a few minutes to give you a bit more detail and a few highlights to consider. Um, first, in terms of the uh, fiscal year that ended on June 30th, the one that was just audited and that we'll hear more about from the auditors on Wednesday night at the select board's regular meeting. Um, the town's general fund again, finished um, that year with an $85,747 surplus. On the revenue side, fees and expenses beat expectations by $11,221. Intergovernmental revenues were $25,647 higher than expected. That consists largely of <coughs> pilot or the state payment in lieu of taxes and current use reimbursements. On the other hand, um, property tax revenues were $9,329 lower than expected. Recreation revenues were $37,265 lower than expected, obviously due to COVID-19 and the impact on programming and fees to be charged. A police revenues were $11,485 lower than expected, again, likely due to a COVID-related decrease in commercial activity, including trucking. Uh, some of the uh, police revenues come in the form of trucks written to overweight trucks coming through our local roads. On the expense side, the town spent uh, $8,748 less than expected on administration, $4,141 less than planned on the planning commission, $7,531 less than budgeted for solid waste management, $2,838 less than budgeted for zoning, and $3,489 less than anticipated for Pittsburgh first response. We also spent $6,047 less than budgeted in the fire department, and $84,751 less than budgeted in the rec department, again, due to the lack of pro programming and expense related to that during the pandemic's worst um, portions. On the other hand, expenses exceeded uh, budgeted amounts in the areas of elections by an order of $10,389. The Board of Civil Authority in the amount of $2,111, Municipal plant and equipment to the order of uh, $10,598, and in the Lister's office, $3,032. I do have now an update on the current year's general fund performance. That's fiscal year 2021 2022. Uh, as you know, the fiscal year runs from July through June. As Alicia mentioned, we look to be just about where we ought to be, roughly two thirds of the way through the current budget. Again, as she said, we're at 68.6% of the budgeted figure. A couple of noteworthy items for the current fiscal year. So far, revenues from state 
um, coffers in the form of pilot, again, payment in lieu of taxes and current use reimbursement have been larger than expected. Traffic fines, again, i.e. ticket revenues for overweight trucks on local roads for the most part, they have exceeded the budgeted figure for the entire year. So that's both good news for the town's bottom line, but also good news for our local roads that are taking um, hopefully less of a pounding with good police enforcement. On the downside, the town has already spent twice the budgeted amount for legal fees associated with zoning matters. That's of course a very volatile item and it depends largely on what gets submitted for permit applications and how complicated those matters are. I have a summary now of the uh, highlights of the proposed 2022-2023 general fund budgets, which will be before you as voters tomorrow, if you haven't already voted. Most of the general fund, of course, consists of wages and benefits for the people working at town offices and in the other departments. There was a 2% wage increase for most employees effective July 1st. And while there was a one-time only um, steady uh, payment of health insurance premiums, this was likely a one-time phenomenon due to some COVID money that came to the rescue. Um, so we have planned to see a substantial increase with the new calendar year kicking in in January. And of course, that's going to affect half of the town's budget year. So we have, instead of assuming a continued 0% increase in health insurance, we've uh, been conservative and now expect something on the order of 4%. And that's what we've budgeted for. Um, over the years, the town has sought out non-tax revenue uh, to ease the burden on taxpayers. Um, so, um, for example, the town has been making some money these last few years by uh, staking out Omia's entrance at their request, mind you, uh, for three shifts per week to help us chase down and ticket overweight trucks that do do damage to local roads in Florence. Omia has been a very good partner on that and they appreciate the work that our police department is doing. As does our other police department customer, the town of Chittenden, to whom we devote 12 to 15 hours of patrols uh, per mm -hmm. week on a pay uh, basis, on a paying basis. In closing, I'd like to thank the department heads, the staff, and of course the select boards for their help in putting these proposed budgets together. As you can imagine, it's always a challenging balancing act to maintain quality of town services while keeping expenses and the burden on taxpayers as low as possible. Uh, thanks very much for your attention. If there are any questions, I'll do my best to try to answer them about the general fund budget. I see one hand. You will have to unmute themselves. Uh, would you please unmute yourself, whoever it is who wants to ask a question? Number 8181. Number, phone number 8181. The last four digits of your phone number are 8181. Would you unmute yourself? Hit it accidentally. Okay, I think we're going to move on. That must have been an accidental hand. We've seen that before. No problem. Thank you, folks. Have a good night. We'll see you again soon in the next few minutes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> And now, uh, Joe Ganya will give the uh, Highway Fund presentation. Are we muted? Did, they, did you mute us? <laughs> Our highway, <clears throat> highway Fund, uh, well, first of all, I guess I should start off by recognizing that the Workers on the highway department have been out there doing a hell of a job all winter taking care of our roads. And, and I think that uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we need to recognize them and, and, and at least tell them that uh, we're happy with what they're doing. Keep the good work up. <clears throat> uh, our highway, when it comes to the uh, uh, money part of it, uh, <clears throat> our highway uh, from uh, we have it. We had a surplus last year of uh, one hundred eighty-three thousand five hundred and forty-five dollars, uh, and that was uh, because 
two or three reasons that uh, built that surplus up, and, and one reason would be that the uh, $67,695 was, was uh, <coughs> recommended by the select board because we, we need to keep a, uh, a good balance in that account, and over several years we have we were kind of running behind on it. <clears throat> Another thing that contributed to it <clears throat> was uh, thirty-nine thousand one hundred or two hundred and one dollars was <clears throat> some state aid that we hadn't planned on that showed up, and so that we were able to uh, <clears throat> use that as uh, to help with our deficit on that shortfall. And then there was another thirty thousand three hundred and fifty-eight. <clears throat> that was uh, accumulated from uh, not having to use quite as much sand and salt. And uh, $24,657 uh, <clears throat> less than it than uh, expected on vehicle supplies, fuel and maintenance. <clears throat> the town has a capital reserve account into which the town <clears throat> puts money every year uh, Set it aside for the purpose of buying vehicles and and <clears throat> whatever we need for equipment. We don't want to have to have a truck and not have the funds available if we can avoid that. <clears throat> right now, the, the uh, as of uh, uh, last June, June thirtieth, we had four hundred eighty-nine thousand two hundred and twenty-four dollars in that reserve account for equipment and whatever heavy duty uh, expenditures that might pop up in front of us. <clears throat> We've got a uh, 550 Ford truck coming. It's ordered. They will be delivering it here soon. So that's going <clears> to <throat> use up a little of this or a, a fair. It's going to cut a hole in that uh, 489,000. <clears> but we'll still have a, a pretty good balance. Uh, the road work done last year uh, the highway crew, uh, they uh, <clears throat> worked on uh, the Sugar Hollow Road, the Downhill Road, Markowski Street, uh, Mark, uh, Mechanic Street, I should say, with stone line ditches. <clears throat> Probably some of you have noticed they, they come along, and especially on where it's, there's hills, <clears throat> they dig out the ditches and put coarse stone in there. It's a uh, it's a, a good thing. It, it, it gets the water out of the road, and it, it's uh, very good for, for holding the soil. And uh, the state has quite a lot of water quality control stuff that uh, they're watching everybody for pollution and, and erosion and stuff. And this is uh, one way that works well in the state. <clears throat> offers grant money to do these sort of things, and it's a real good program. <clears throat> the town, <clears throat> with their own equipment, uh, do this work, put this uh, stone in these places, and, and there's grant money that, that covers the cost for just about all of it, so that, that's really a good thing. <clears throat> the, uh, the town... Uh, uh, here, so shit. Okay, we we had got our salt salt sand shed completed. Took a little longer than what we had hoped when we first started talking about it, but uh, it's turned out to be uh, <clears throat> something that we're very uh, very glad to have. And that was covered eighty percent of it, which was paid for by state and federal grants. <clears throat> uh, the town. Uh, uh, because of complaints from residents along the Oxbow Road about dust, uh, put down what we call a chip seal. It's kind of ground up uh, pavement that's uh, put down and packed down. And most, <clears throat> I don't know if most anybody that has passed over that, including myself, uh, been pretty impressed with how it's turned out. It's worked well, and we've been very happy. And, the people that live up there in that area seem to be uh, quite satisfied with the results of that. And that's turned out to be a, a good thing for that neighborhood. Uh, 
<clears throat> this winter has been probably an average winter. Uh, <clears throat> it may surprise you to know that uh, uh, frequent small storms can be more expensive than just a few big heavy storms in, in the amount of time and, and equipment and salt and sand and stuff that uh, uh, it takes to uh, deal with these small storms. You gotta keep going back to treating the roads. <laughs> but uh, they've done a real good, real great job. Uh, plans for the coming year, we're looking forward. <clears throat> hopes to, we hope to install a box culvert on the south end of the West Creek Road. <clears throat> and uh, also that, oh, about <clears throat> nine tenths of a mile on the south end there, the pavement was real rough and all kind of broke up and they ground it all up and backed it down. And so <clears throat> next year, as it, if it uh, works out, we're going to be able to tire that and, and, and fix that up the way we want it. But uh, by grinding up the uh, present road and backing it down, uh, it's made it smoother and better for the folks to travel on. <clears throat> uh, the highway pro will uh, uh, reconstruct a sh short length of the Oxbow Road, which uh, <clears throat> will be uh, another improvement up in that neighborhood. And, uh, the uh, <clears throat> highway crew will oversee about a mile on the Whipple Hollow Road, uh, including putting in some culverts and replacing uh, some gravel and stuff wherever it needs it. And uh, about a mile stretch on the Furnace Road, the highway crew will oversee uh, uh, Paving. Stripping. <clears throat> stripping the uh, striping. That's painting the lines down the road. Comes in pretty handy if it's foggy or something to have lines in the road so you can find where you're going. <clears throat> Last year we uh, wanted to do it, but it was, well, partly because of the the Kobe business, but we, it got so late in the season, we couldn't get anybody to come and do it, so we held off and we're going to do it this year. <clears throat> uh, another thing that we'll do next, this coming summer is, is the, what they call cracked ceiling. They go along where the blacktop is cracking, lets the water down in, that gets, starts to deteriorate the bottom of the roadbed. Uh, they put this crack seal as a tar that they pour in the cracks. <clears throat> and that's, we've done this a few times in the past, and it seems to be a good investment. Works out well, and we're going to do, do that wherever they figure it's needed. <clears throat> uh, they've got some more stone line ditches that they want to work on. Uh, Creed Hill Road. And the Humphrey Road are a couple. They may even have some more if they have time and the, the funds hold up. Uh, and uh, looking ahead, uh, the town will try to meet the goal of resurfacing paving roads. We'd like, <clears throat> like to think that we can do them in, in, the, in the 10 to 12 year range. That uh, seems like it uh, keeps them together and sealed up. And, it's a lot better to try to get it done in that time frame than it is to let them go until they're all tore up and broke up and you got to reconstruct the whole thing. And it, it's just much more costly that way. Uh, <clears throat> another thing we've talked about is uh, <clears throat> there are more for mowing the roadsides. We uh, have got two machines and, uh, and they're, they're, they are getting... Uh, some age on them, and, and we was considering our, our road foreman was uh, hoping that uh, maybe we could upgrade some of that <coughs> equipment. So we decided that perhaps we would try renting an arm mower. Uh, I figure maybe every couple of years that knocks the brush back. You can reach right up and cut the stuff up kind of up high and 
Rather than to spend over $100,000 to buy a machine, we're going to try renting one. At least it's going to be an experiment to see how that works out cost effective. Yeah, see how cost effective it is. It may turn out to be the better way to go. And we're going to, we're, we're going to uh, give it a try anyway. And uh, I guess that kind of covers it pretty much. Uh, if there's any question, perhaps I can answer them. I don't know if anybody wants to add to this. Uh, go ahead. If not, thank you for, for your uh, <coughs> listening to me and to talk. <coughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, Clarence Greeno wasn't able to be here tonight, so John Haverstock will be reading the Water and Sewer Commission presentation as well as the next few articles. I warned you that you weren't through with me just yet tonight. Hi, everybody. Again, I'm John Haverstock, and uh, Clarence Greeno, the chair of the Water and Sewer Commission, was not able to make it tonight, so I've, just, I've agreed to pinch hit for him tonight. I'll just uh, say a few words about the operations of the Water and Sewer Commission and the Water and Sewer Departments. Um, as you may know, the Water and Sewer Commission was formed in November of 2007, and today it consists of the chair, Clarence Greeno, the vice chair, Hank Pelkey, Helen McKinley, Baird Morgan, and Ernie Clarehue. Um, the commission works with the town manager to oversee operations of the water and sewer departments as they work to bring safe, clean, delicious drinking water to customers and to properly handle and treat wastewater. On the long range planning front, the state plans to upgrade several segments of US Route 7 in town, beneath which much of the town's water and sewer infrastructure is located. Um, and that will determine the state's plans will largely determine the timing and expense of those town projects to upgrade water and sewer. Butch mentioned a little bit before about how the state intends to deal with Route 7 segment by segment. Um, for example, the state is nearly done upgrading segment one of Route 7, which is the stretch south of the mobile station. Because the state now plans to replace the bridge on Furnace Brook near the mobile station, in 2022 and 2023, the town has had to retain an engineer to design the best way to relocate our water main, which is now attached to the bridge. There will be a temporary relocation of the water main during bridge construction and then a final relocation after the bridge work has been completed. Generally speaking, the water system is working well and has sufficient revenues to cover operating costs, debt obligations, and even to put a little money aside each year in a capital fund to help pay for future improvements. Uh, for example, the town recently acquired land around our auxiliary reservoirs and cut trees which had threatened those reservoirs. On another note, the commission and town staff are closely watching events in Washington, D.C. because as regulations take shape, it's beginning to look like the focus is on improving uh, drinking water safety. And it may be that towns across America, including Pittsburgh, will have to inventory all of its water infrastructure, including privately owned water service lines for pressure for the presence of lead. So stay tuned. It may be that some service lines um, will have to be replaced, hopefully with the help of federal funding. The federal government is identifying the problem. Hopefully they'll provide some funding to deal with it. The Water and Sewer Commission has recently completed the replacement of two aging and increasingly unreliable uh, sewer pump stations on Depot Hill Road. Aside from better, more efficient performance, these new pump stations will provide significantly improved safety for town staff, which must maintain them. Finally, the town used remaining project funds to install a backup generator at the wastewater treatment plant. And this we all hope and expect will keep the facility operating during power outages that do happen from time to time. These, well, with these projects, of course, came the need to incur debt 
And as we explained before the bond vote, sewer rates had to be increased to accommodate this debt and to address a persistent operating deficit in the sewer fund. The commission met several times and spent many hours with a consultant to fashion new sewer rates, which the commission felt were um, fair and equitable. Nobody likes a rate increase, but um, the commission felt that it had arrived at the rates generating enough revenue, but by being fair and equitable to everybody. The new rate structure was explained in a letter and in several other ways to customers before July 1st when they became effective. Uh, finally, a few words about personnel. The Water and Sewer Commission wishes to thank Water and Sewer Superintendent Sean Hendy, Assistant Water and Sewer Superintendent Tyler Allen, and Wastewater Operator Bob Berardo for their skilled and dedicated service for many, many years. And so on behalf of Clarence Greeno, uh, thank you very much. If there are questions related to water and sewer projects or topics, I'd be happy to try, try to deal with them. I guess I don't see any questions, so we can uh, move on with the next uh, stages. Um, article four, do you want me to continue with this? Yep. Sure. Article four uh, has to do with the village fund. It's a pretty modest sized fund every year. I believe the town residents of the village contribute a total of $16,000 toward the maintenance, mostly of street lights in the village. Um, in the past, um, that matter has not generated too much discussion in town, but if there are any questions about it, I'd be happy to try to field them. No questions about the village um, fund, very well. Tax collection dates, of course, another fairly non-controversial item also will appear on your ballot. Helen McKinley has suggested uh, three dates and uh, we hope that uh, the voters will carefully consider those dates and uh, give your consent. Article six involves a retail cannabis sales question. And I want to make it clear that the select board has taken no position, at least as a board, one way or the other about this question. But it felt that the people should have an opportunity to be heard on this matter. And so the question that's going to be before you in Article 6 asks whether the voters of Pittsford um, are agreeable to allowing the sale of cannabis on a retail basis in Pittsford. I think I've seen... Uh, Publications talking about the fact that, you know, many towns have dealt with this last year at town meeting and about 40 more towns are considering it this year at town meeting. Are there any questions on that topic? I'm not seeing any. And so I will then move on to uh, announcements regarding the logistics of Australian ball balloting, um, which can take place um, through seven o'clock tomorrow. Of course, you can drop off your ballots um, at Tuesday until seven o'clock in the drop box or in person at the town offices, or you can bring your ballot tomorrow between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. to the firehouse and cast your ballot uh, in person. Are there any questions about the procedure for tomorrow? <clears throat> Okay, with that, I will um, ask whether Alicia wants to accept a motion to adjourn this hearing. Oh, it's been asked whether we can go ahead and announce the identity of the new town manager. The answer is yes. It'll appear in a press release tomorrow, so probably in your local paper in the day or two thereafter. But uh, Brenda uh, Fox Howard of Maine has agreed to take on the position of Pittsburgh's uh, town manager and her anticipated start date will be April 4th, uh, during which we will have a two week transition period to get her settled in. And uh, we certainly wish her all the best in her position and we hope that you'll be able to give her all the cooperation and support you've given me all these years. Thank you very much.
Thank you, John. And we just want to acknowledge John's 14 years, 14 years of dedication to the town of Pittsburgh. Um, he's also uh, graciously um, been flexible with his um, stop time to give uh, Brenda time to find housing here and get adjusted to the position as town manager before he leaves. So just want to thank uh, thank John for everything and hope to, uh, wish him luck in whatever he uh, goes on to do after this. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, John. <laughs> And with that, we have a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night.